This is the Power Latin America podcast, and today we've got an interview with 47 Kilo rising star Jessica Espinal, just days out from Power Latin America Nationals. Jessica had a monster year in 2022, and she has even bigger plans for 2023, starting with PA Nats and qualifying for the U.S. national team. Before I bring Jessica in, don't forget PA Nats will be streamed live on the SPD Apparel YouTube account. Thank you to SPD and Aleco for their continued partnership with Powerlifting America. If you're looking to compete in drug-tested powerlifting, whether you're just starting out or want to compete with the best in the world, make sure you go to powerlifting-america.com, become a member, check out our event page for all of our upcoming events and our store page for PA merch. Okay, with that, let's get on to the interview with Jessica Espinal. All right, what's up, Jessica Espinal? Welcome to the Powerlifting America podcast. Hello, I'm like happy to be here. <laughs> yeah, of course. Did I pronounce your name right? Is it Jessica Espinal? It's Jessica Espinal. Espinal. So, uh, yeah, okay, better than okay. um, better than most people do. <laughs> Espinal. So the accent is on the e. Yeah. Espinal. Okay. And that's going to be hard for me to break because in my head I've been calling you Espinal like it's for okay. so long. That's okay, but yeah, <laughs> I'll try to get it right. Anyway, and also, do you like to be called Jessica or Jess or Jesse? Uh, I know your Instagram handles Jesse Baby Forty Seven KG, right? Yeah, um, I don't really have a preference. People just call me anything um, with Jess, J, whatever. It doesn't matter. All right, yeah, we'll call you Jess then. I think that just rolls off the tongue super short and nice. Um, so, Jess, twenty twenty two, it was a huge year for you. You really came onto the scene in the 47 kilo weight class with huge performances at first at collegiate nationals, um, earlier in the year where you hit a 400 kilo total to win the collegiate national title. Then you hit a 402 total at mega nats to win an open national title. So two titles, national championships in one year. Um, and then most recently in your qualifying meet for power, power of the American nationals, you hit a whopping 412.5 kilo total, a huge 10 kilo PR for you. And obviously a really successful meet. Um, so you've had a massive year. And so obviously that's why I want to get you on the podcast, let everyone know about you, uh, get, let people get to know you a little bit. Have you done any of these podcasts before? Um, I believe I've done Solana's podcast. Okay. Uh, that's right. But other than that, no, I don't think so. That's right. I did listen to you on Solana. I was like, I know I heard her somewhere before. Oh yeah. That's fantastic. Solana's ahead of the curve always. <laughs> um, so we'll get into your huge 2022 year um, and because, you know, like two national titles and then a huge uh, 10 kilo PR and everything. You obviously had a great year. So we want to really dig into that. Um, but since I haven't really heard too much of your backstory and a lot of our audience probably hasn't unless they listen to Solana's podcast. Um, why don't you give us, you know, the, your backstory going all the way back? Where did you grow up? When did you start lifting and like what you what got you into the sport? Okay, well, I grew up um, in Houston, Texas this whole time, my whole life. Basically, I've been there. Um, mm -hmm. I've traveled a bit here and there, but nothing major. Um, honestly, I got into lifting in high school. In Texas, it's a bigger thing than in most other states. Um, most high schools have a powerlifting team. Uh, mine was very small. We had at most 15 people on there. Um, mm -hmm. And I was, of course, one of the first few girls that wanted to do it, too. Um, I cool. think something about my childhood that is kind of like maybe people don't know about is yeah. that I actually grew up kind of like poor. Like, okay. I wouldn't say that I've ever been in a point where I'm like ahead of anybody, right, in that mm -hmm. type of aspect. Um, so it's taken me a lot to get here. And I don't think... I'd be here without the support I currently have. Mm -hmm. So you must, do you have like a, a really strong family background um, that has helped you a, a good support network that's helped you get to your place where you are now? Yeah, actually, I think my biggest supporter has been my sister because ever since I started lifting, she has always been there. Like she always used to go to all my high school meets. Um, she went to my first USAPL and like collegiate mm -hmm. meets everything and no matter what she would always be there like recording and she's the reason why I have so many old videos even though they're embarrassing um, <laughs> they're like shot on old phones and stuff yeah yeah they're yeah, yeah. so like <laughs> oh god so <laughs> you're gonna have to do some of those like before and now before and now like tiktok videos and stuff like that yeah I think footage. I should um I think I actually have one on my um Instagram right now it's like my bench progress and it goes okay. all the way to like my first meet like ever 
Okay. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So people have to definitely um, check that out. But so do you think that um, powerlifting, like you mentioned that you grew up poor in Houston and do you, did you do other sports? Were you able to afford to do like team, other team sports and things like that? Yeah. Well, luckily um, we had enough, right. To get by and maybe even mm -hmm. extra here and there. Mm -hmm. um, so my parents decided to put me or my sisters sometimes in sports. So I think I started ballet when I was six. Oh, wow. And I actually really loved it. I think um, the reason why I wanted to do it was because of the Disney, no, not even Disney, the Barbie movies, mm -hmm. like because of that. And I love their like puffy dresses and all oh, that. My goodness. And I was just like, I need to be that. <laughs> so, you are so young. What, how old are you right now? I'm 21. Okay. So you are 21 now. And then this last year that you've been competing all the meets, I think you, you were 20. Um, yeah. and obviously, you know, you said you started lifting it in high school. So you actually started lifting when you were 16. So you've started like at a good young age. Um, yeah. and then, so you did ballet when you were starting, when you were six years old, did you do other sports as well? Um, I think as the years went on, um, I like started getting introduced to more sports and all that. So in middle school and high school, I did basically everything you could think of, like okay. cross country, track, volleyball, basketball, um, cheer but just mm -hmm. everything basically and did you excel at any other other sports or which one was your favorite um I think my favorite was like volleyball and probably track because I did pole vault I wouldn't say I was like amazing <laughs> mm -hmm. wow that's I, crazy pole vault is scary to me yeah um I couldn't even make it past like the seven foot like pole I could only make it over the beginner one and like the, after that I was like no but but you I use the pole and everything and yeah yeah oh that's crazy so, I think that was an advantage for me but I wouldn't say I was like great at any of them I just really love to be active ever since I was young mm. and that's interesting um the, some of those sports like volleyball is for really tall people um and you're a 47 <laughs> kilo lifter so how tall are you I'm 4'10 10. So, I mean, was there like a point where you're just like, okay, volleyball is out. Basketball is out. Yeah. Um, actually a funny story about basketball is that I think my eighth grade year, I was playing a match or something. Um, and I was one of the fastest on the team, I think, cause I was the smallest. Right. So I could just get down around the court, like super fast. Mm -hmm. Um, and on the other side of the court guarding, like our goal um there's always like the tallest biggest girl of on the other team and I would always be the first one like running down and like trying to block her and I'd always get fouled because I'd always either like touch her arms or like do something and or you get a foul called on you yeah yeah, yeah. because of that <laughs> yeah I could see that yeah I could see that I was very similar I was extremely small whenever I played uh, like basketball in middle school and I I fouled out like every every game uh, yeah. same reason I did that all the time. <laughs> I didn't care. <laughs> yeah. So, um, that's great to hear though. I mean, so you have like a multi-sport background, so you've been always been super active. And then in high school in Texas, you have this luxury of, you know, um, having powerlifting in high schools, which is pretty rare. I think there's only a handful of States that have that. Mm -hmm. And so what was that? What was that like? Like, how did you get recruited onto the team? And, you know, like how did, how was it, uh, lifting in high school in Texas? Cause I've heard all different kinds of perspectives and stories on it. Um, it's all single ply, right? Um, yeah. so how, how was that experience? Um, okay. So I got recruited by a friend in my chemistry class. So at the time I would only do track and I was also a band kid. So I had all that going on oh, and, wow. um, <laughs> yeah, I know. Right. So weird. <laughs> Renaissance woman, musician, <laughs> sports, doing pole vaulting, basketball, volleyball, all this. That's cool. Yeah. So then he was all like, oh, we need girls on the powerlifting team because he was on it since he was a freshman. He was also one of the lighter weight lifters. Um, so he's all like, we need a small girl to join the team. And you look like you would fit that. And I'm like, okay. mm, I don't know. I wasn't really intrigued. I didn't really want to lift. I only wanted to lift like in regards to like track because I was currently doing that. Okay. it wasn't really like um something that appealed to me and did you guys do did you do lifting in track yeah um, I did both of them at the same time actually for about a year I mean like for your track team did they did they have you in the in the weight room um lifting yeah. weights and stuff oh yeah wow. cool. um yeah so whenever he like told me that 
I was like, I don't really want to go. And then he's like, okay, just bring like clothes and like you could try it out one day. And I'm like, okay, I would always forget my clothes. I just wouldn't bring them. I don't know. <laughs> you were do just it. blowing them off. <laughs> and then I think after like Thanksgiving break, he was all like, okay, give it an actual shot this time. Like actually go. And I was like, you know what? Okay, sure. And I went and I'll be honest, I didn't like it at first either way. Okay. Okay. Like, <laughs> wow. Well, I'm gonna. I'm curious to hear like what brought you in, and we need to thank whoever like got you to actually like it. Um, yeah. Why Why didn't you like it at first? I think because I just felt like, like it wasn't natural. It doesn't come natural to me. So whenever I was like under a barbell or something, like it just felt unnatural to like squat that low because we'd only like quarter squat and track and bench. I've never even benched. Like I couldn't even like bench the bar. I, mm. Nothing. Right. So I was like, this is not for me. I think the thing that brought me in though is that like the next time I try to practice this was like the second practice you could say mm -hmm. there's somebody more experienced that came in and um he was all like I want you to try this and he literally was all like try to sumo deadlift I'm like what is that like mm -hmm. sumo wrestler like mm -hmm. yeah <laughs> <laughs> and then oh, man. yeah he taught me like how to set up and like everything obviously to the best of his ability too, because he was also a student. And I think my first deadlift like in practice was maybe like 185. So I was like, oh, wow. that's like not bad, right? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So then I think after that, I was like, I kind of want to keep doing this. Okay, so you kind of found out that you were good at it, um, especially yeah. like when he got you doing the sumo deadlift. And then, yeah. and then how was like your first competitive experience? You started, you know, you kind of got hooked onto the team and then how was like the first meet in high school? Um, it a lot of the like local meets in high school leading up to like regionals or something are usually in a school's weight room, like okay. in their weight okay. room. Um, so we would travel to like different schools around the area, maybe like 15 minutes away. Um, and I'm gonna be honest, like getting commands down was hard for me at first, mm -hmm. especially I think um like bench I don't know I think yeah. everybody has a hard time with bench commands at first um for sure it's the trick yeah. mm -hmm. and I don't know like it was it was okay I think I only won because I was the lightest in there was nobody else in my weight class <laughs> in your weight class okay yeah. yeah and I mean what um I'm looking at the weight classes now like they they have like a what is it a 44 mm -hmm. kilo weight class or something so that's it. That's extra small. And so, yeah. So did you, it looks like you did face some pretty stiff challenge though, like in your, uh, at this state level in Texas. Yeah. Um, and then you also, I think won a regionals mm -hmm. as well, at, like maybe your last year. And so, so you got on the team as a sophomore mm -hmm. and you kind of started getting into it. And you, you mentioned at the very beginning, it was like, it wasn't, it didn't feel natural to you, like just having the barbell and like the movement itself just felt weird, but also how was single ply? Because now you're a totally raw lifter, uh, we, we call classic, um, mm -hmm. very, can be very confusing, but now, now you've been lifting raw only for, um, a good amount of time, a couple of years. And so, yeah, thinking back on those single ply days, like, was it just super weird? Like the first time you saw a bench shirt, how, how did that make you feel? <laughs> It was so weird because I was thinking they're showing me these little tiny shirts that like had no stretch, like nothing. And like, I couldn't even get it over my head, like the head hole. That was always the hardest part for me because my arms were like super skinny little at the time, mm -hmm. but it was always my head. I think I just had a big head or something. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, don't really expect me to fit into this. Like, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and then, um, I think the suit was like it was okay obviously like it hurt and I would get bruises and like I would sometimes bleed on my legs from like the mm. tightness of the suit but oh and also the wrist wraps wait no not even wrist wraps knee wraps my bad oh yeah knee those wraps, were pretty yeah. bad those yeah were... yeah those would bruise like all around my knee all the time mm -hmm. but then you just got used to it and then you just kind of took it as like hey this is this is the sport it's this is like this is what you have to wear or did you see raw powerlifting out there and think oh I wish I could just like put on some knee sleeves and like a belt and that's it um I think the first time I saw like lifting outside of like um I guess equipment mm -hmm. was um like Steffi Cohen's animal cage like 500 something deadlift okay. and after, that, after seeing that I was all like 
maybe this is the sport for me because there's little people doing these big things mm -hmm. and like I could probably do that one day but at the time obviously I was thinking like equipped and like all that stuff mm -hmm. yeah it's interesting you're very self-aware for someone who was like in high school and you're basically like little people like you must have at some point realized like okay I'm not gonna be like six foot six and play volleyball uh, or basketball or something like that. And you started doing pole vaulting, which is kind of interesting because like basically like the pole is helping you be taller and, and everything. So that's very cool. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, it's, that's cool. You kind of found something that like you're a perfect fit for and you found a team. Do you think having that high school team and having people kind of show you the sport, um, you know, like if you had just been kind of like wanting to lose weight or something and walked into a gym and saw someone deadlifting or something, do you think you would have got pulled into the sport in the same way as if you, you know, did finding it in high school as a high school sport? Um, honestly, probably not. Um, I think at the time I wouldn't even like go to the gym outside of school. I was mostly just like a nerd and I would just study all the time. Yeah. I, I found that fun. I don't know how I did, but anyway, um, I think having like somebody recruit me and especially somebody that I was close to at the time, um, like bring me in and like show me how to do this and this and have like be so welcoming for me. I think that really helped me stay in and like want to do it more. Yeah, that's why I think that the high school stuff, even though it's single ply, which is a little bit, you know, strange and, and maybe one day they'll change it to raw. Um it's still so good for the sport, our sport. I mean, like we have to have this or we wouldn't have someone like Jessica Espinal. I, I try to pronounce it right. Um, in, in our sport, you know, and a rising star, uh, hopefully a future legend of the sport, you know, and you would have never even tried it if it wasn't for someone in your chemistry class pulling you in, in high school. So I find, I think that's just so cool. And it's so, so important for the sport to have these kind of teams like that. Um, and so you just mentioned you were a nerd and you're always studying. You also mentioned you were on band. So definitely like doubling down on the nerdiness. Um, and then, <laughs> and then, uh, what were your accolades then, you know, coming out of high school? Cause I see you on Instagram where I'm most familiar with you in the last like six, eight months on Instagram. I see you're always studying you're in some like really, uh, smart program or something. And so I want to get into, you know, um, what were your accolades kind of like coming out of high school? So like, my so like you, you had won some regionals like in powerlifting and then did you graduate like 4.0? Were you like the valedictorian of your class and, um, you know, all of that kind of stuff. So brag about your, your academic and your band performances and everything. <laughs> Honestly, I think I was in wind ensemble in band. So oh, that's okay. like the highest like level of band. Okay, at cool at my school um we were actually pretty good I think um what did you play but I played clarinet and eventually oh. bass bass clarinet see yeah. I played clarinet like in elementary school um, <laughs> and I played it for one year like in fifth grade or something but so I can relate <laughs> yeah I ended up loving it like I uh -huh. um I don't know if I go back but I think it was a good experience mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and do you still play you ever break it out uh, no I think oh. I pick it up like to meme around and to just play like <laughs> random music like popular music uh, but other than that I don't um uh, but other than okay. band, I think I didn't graduate valedictorian but I was top five percent I did have a 4.0 in high school um okay. and of course A&M was my first pick because of how close it was to home and also they were helping me a lot with like um the government funding to be able to go so that was a big plus as well. Is there like some kind of rule in Texas where if you finish in the top 5% of your class, you can get a scholarship to like any of the state schools or something like that? Um, I think it's top 5% or I think they increased it. Or top 1% or something. Yeah. Um, I think you get like automatic admission to most public schools. Okay. That's what is automatic um, admission. Yeah. Yeah. I think it was that. So that really helped me too. And I, I also worked really hard. Like I was in dual credit and AP classes just to like be able to get in and out of college faster. Wow. <laughs> so you're super smart. All right. So I try. Well, that's good. I mean, you're an overachiever on the academic side and that's, that's great. Cause like, that's your future right there, you know? Um, and then what were your power of team accolades coming out of high school? Did you, um, I, I mean, I, it looks like you won a regionals. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. So in high school, I never really got anything less than gold, except at okay. that one state meet. What and, happened there? What was the problem? Um, that was my junior year. I actually won regionals that year. And then okay, um, that. 
went to state and I got, I think third place or sixth place. I'm not really sixth sure. Place is what it yeah, says on open powerlifting at least. Yeah. And honestly, I think I was kind of upset. I don't remember why I didn't do well. Um, I think it was probably just nerves first time being a huge, like they have it in a stadium. So it's like, it's a huge thing. Oh, wow. And there are so many other girls with better equipment than I had. Like, like I said, my school um, is also like kind of in the. It's okay. <laughs> Sorry, my dog is like. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. Anyway, um, the area that I was in my high school didn't have like a lot of funding, especially for like powerlifting because it's mm -hmm. a smaller sport. Um, so we didn't have like the best equipment. We were working with what we had. Yeah. Um, and then just seeing people with like these decked out like crazy singlets and shirts and everything, I just maybe felt intimidated. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I'm not really sure what went wrong, but then that yeah. really fueled me for my next year. Yeah. So it fueled you. And then it also kind of gives you that a little bit of experience that like big meat energy, you know, that you need to have in order to compete at the highest level, which, which mm -hmm. you're at now. Um, and so then what happened your senior year, I saw that you finished first in regionals on open powerlifting. Did you mm -hmm. then go to state after that? It doesn't have it if you did. Um, so actually that year was 2020 COVID. Oh yeah. yeah I see that got canceled. And I was actually very upset about that. Cause I was training, like I had actually, um, like gotten a membership outside of school and like started training for all that up until like the week of, and then they announced that it was canceled and I was really oh, upset. Damn. Mm -hmm. damn. Yeah. It looked like your total, um, was just going up and up and up. And like, you hit a huge, like almost a 40 kilo PR, um, mm -hmm. between your, your last high school meet and that regional meet. So yeah, you must've been psyched with a 40 kilo PR, uh, almost a 40 kilo PR going in at the regionals. And then, yeah, you would want to show it off at nationals. So that's, that's rough. Yeah. I forget you're so young. Like you went through, um, COVID in, in high school that, <laughs> yeah. that, that must've been so weird. And then, so then transitioning from there, um, into college, were you recruited to lift in college? Um, well, I don't think AM really has a recruiting system, okay. but yeah, I went on the team. You went on the team. So it was a thing where you just sign up? Um, yeah, you sign up and try out and yeah, they just pick you, the officers just pick you. It looks like your first raw meet was something called the quarantine classic in 2020. Now, what is that? Was it a uh Zoom meet or something or um no, so it was like um the me, I guess, for newcomers on the okay. team that year. This was like November 2020. So the pandemic had been going on for like a while since then. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cool. We had to lift in masks and it was like our first meet for everybody like joining the team that year. Okay. Awesome. And it, it looks like, so your previous total was 340 in, in single ply. And then mm -hmm. you came out and your first total raw was 290. Mm -hmm. So you took a big drop from that. Now, fast forward, you're doing 412. You're doing be better in just two short years raw than you ever did, even with equipment. So you've you've obviously made really amazing progress since that point. Do you have any advice for someone like you? You did. You're at this high point. You're winning in high school. You're taking first place in regionals. You're putting up these big totals in in single ply. Then you come on the college team. COVID's happening and stuff, and your total drops pretty considerably. But it looks like you went nine for nine. Um, you had a good meet. And so, you know, a lot of people are like, oh, I'm not strong enough to compete in a meet or something like that. Um, do you have any advice for someone who's like just getting into a sport on the raw side or maybe switching from single ply to raw and worrying about their numbers going down? Honestly, um, just keep at it. Your numbers will be different because you have all the additional support of all your other equipment. Doing it raw is a different beast. Like you have to learn how to discipline yourself and keep going, even though things seem hard. Or um, if you keep failing like weights that you used to take like for sevens or something, like it will yeah. always be like, that. even at this high level, like you will always come up to like walls. You will always hit a wall eventually. Mm -hmm. um, and honestly, you just have to keep digging at it. That's it. That's, like That's great advice. I mean, you know, from someone, so you're wise beyond your years, you know, you've already figured this out so early in the game. So uh, no wonder you've had such great success. So your very next meet, like five months after that, you put up a 350. So you, you surpassed your best equipped total in a meet 
Um, looks like you, you know, went to uh, seven for nine, but still that's an amazing jump from 290 to 350. Um, that's a really big, uh, you know, uh, what is that? Like a 60 kilo jump. So what went into that? What do you think? Was it just the, the training of, uh, uh, you know, t- practicing raw or did you get a coach or something or what happened? Well, actually after, um, like the Aggie quarantine mm-hmm. meet, I re I realized really quickly that I wasn't going to get far unless I got serious about coaching and serious about my nutrition. Cause I was also, I think I competed 52 at that meet at the mm-hmm. Aggie. Um, and Both actually before, before that, like even during COVID I had gotten up to like one thirty, So I had already worked up or I guess work down to the body weight that I was at. Um, okay. Yeah, during COVID, it just like, you know, you have nothing to do. Of course, whatever. you, you yeah. were super active before. Now you're not as active and stuff. Like you were doing all these sports and most of them were tied to high school. And then you, you kind of got robbed out of your senior year of high school. So yeah, so then after that, um, yeah, I, I realized all those things. And then I was like, you know what? I'll reach out to I think the current team coach which was Rob Escalante um and he was all like yeah we could do something for you because I was on the team coaching and so then I wanted something more personal so he said I could do that for you we could you know figure that out and yeah we had a great time that's great and that's when you started to see like what what do you think again like if you're kind of like advising someone else that was in your shoes you know you come in at the quarantine classic your number drops off Mm -hmm. and then you put in five months of hard work and boom, it takes off again. Was there any kind of, do you think it was just Rob's coaching or was there technique things that you ironed out that you weren't doing before or what was it? I think it was basically all technique. I think that was the hardest part for me. It was getting used to, you know, squatting um, the way that my body's built instead of like looking at somebody else's squat or benching. I know I was one of those one inch ROM benchers um, in USAPL and deadlift. We figured out my deadlift. I used to do like frog stance, kind of like Angelo, uh-huh. but then I gradually just went out and out and out. And so during that time um, in that, in that sort of five month period, and this would be like your freshman year of college, mm-hmm. I'm guessing, right. Yeah. Um, you figured out mostly you think it was from the bench arch that you gained a lot. And then also that I mean, because your your bench actually only went up like uh, your bench only went up like ten kilos, and it looks like yeah, your deadlift went up a ton, um, mm-hmm. and even your squat went up kind of a lot as well. So, but you think it's like bench arch, and then like the sumo technique that you use now—that's the main factors that drove your total up. Yeah, I think most of his technique stuff like just worked for me. Like everything just started falling into place. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So this second meet that we're talking about, that was actually, um, collegiate nationals yeah. um, and you finish in third. So what did that feel like? Cause you've been only finishing in first for a while. That was the first like big hit that took like for my heart. I was like, uh-huh. Oh my God, I'm not first anymore guys. Like, <laughs> were you having was- flashbacks to the time that you finished six that state and thinking, Oh God, here we go again. Something like that. Yeah. Yeah, honestly, I was super upset, especially because it came out to like last deadlift. And I think I only got third because of body weight, too. So I was oh. so upset because I knew that third deadlift probably wasn't there that day. But like I was very upset because it was that much, like so close. I think everybody was like two and a half or five kilos like under each other for that. Yeah. Wow. Mm-hmm. That's great. And so I'm assuming after that, that, that kind of fueled you to like, really like, Hey, I want to win now. Some people at that point could have said, Hey, you know what? I'm going up against these people, the best, and maybe this isn't for me. And you finished in third and you said, no, I'm coming back next year to win this. Yep, exactly. All right. So then, um, in that next year, um, you know, you put on a ton more onto your total, um, going from 350 up to your huge breakout performance at collegiate nationals where you hit the 400 kilo total, um, which I believe if I look, um, is one of the biggest totals in history at 47 kilos. Is that right? Um, I think so. I'm not really sure. I mean, I think you're only maybe the second American to, to ever hit a 400 kilo total. And I mean, um, Heather Connor only had done it a couple of times as, I mean, she's only done it, you know, a handful of times even since, 
Um, and this was like similar time period. This is like 2021. Um, or I guess, you know, so, so at that time, only one person, as far as I know, had ever even done it. So that must, and you're in college, you're, well, let me click back over onto yours. I mean, you were what, 19 years old, yeah. or I guess you had turned 20 by the time, uh, this collegiate nationals ro rolled around. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. So how did that feel? I mean, all of a sudden I, I remember seeing you get reposted and, um, and, and, you know, it was like a big thing on social media, like the 400 kilo barrier has been broken by another 47 kilo lifter. Um, how did that, how did that make you feel? Were you like an overnight star? Did Honestly, you feel like you were? Yeah, kind of, because like my phone just kept blowing up. Even now, like that powerlifting America is like making all these posts. I had to mute everything because it's just uh -huh. distracting me. Um, <laughs> that's exactly how I felt back then. It was kind of cool because I always set goals like above and beyond for myself, even if they don't seem like super achievable at the time like eventually I have gotten there so that was like my first oh my gosh I can do this like this I can be big maybe you, one day you could like be one of the best of all time mm -hmm. did that thought cross your mind like I could be the goat of powerlifting or 47s at least one day yeah I just thought like if I can do this like who knows my limits now because I thought that would be my limit because it's obviously like nobody most people hadn't done that or a lot of people, only Heather, like you just said, she had for, done that. From the U.S., I think it's only Heather. I think uh, maybe Weiling Chen had done something. And then, you know, Tiff was like kind of in the neighborhood as well. Um, yeah. But yeah, there's only a couple, you know, handful of people on the planet at your weight class that had done that. So that mm -hmm. must have been so amazing. And again, like you're doing it as a 20-year-old. At this point, you're like, what, a sophomore in college? Um, I'm actually a junior and I hope to graduate in December. <laughs> Wow. I mean, so when you hit the 400 kilo total, I think, were you a sophomore? Yes. Yes. You were in your second year in college. Yeah. Wow. That's amazing. And I mean, that's like such a huge success. And then of course, so at that time was Rob still coaching you? Um, for collegiates? Yeah. Yes. Um, he was, he was. And then he also coached you then into your mega nat mega nationals win as well. Um, yes, yes. Okay, cool. And then, so tell us, like, you went from a 400, um, at, and then three months later, you put up a, a 402. So tell us about how do they compare to each other? Like you, you, they're both national titles, um, one in open, one in collegiate level. And, uh, you know, how, how, which one was more special for you? And how did it feel? You know, um, how do they compare to each other? Um, I'm going to be honest, I think maybe collegiates um, at the time was definitely more of a big thing for me. Mm -hmm. um, because on open, like, you know, that those three months later, I feel like I didn't do what I could have at that meet. Like, I feel okay. like I came short of any goal that I had. But in collegiates, like I definitely I think I reached everything that I wanted. And that was the first time that I was like, like very happy with my performance. And you went nine for nine. Um, mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, there's nothing to be, you know, obviously there's really nothing to complain about. You go nine for nine. It looks like at Mega Nats, you missed your last deadlift. What was that about? Um, so actually during, I think our second attempt deadlifts, like our flight was with 52s, I think right after mm -hmm. um, in prime time, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. It and, was in prime time. Yeah. And um, what is it? I think the lifting cast shut down or they had accidentally like closed down our flight, like for the 47s. So all of us had to wait 20 to 30 minutes. And obviously I was like, I think the second to last puller. So I had more time, like me and Kate Cohen, I think we were the last two. So we had more time than anybody waiting for that last pull. Um, and I think both of us missed our last pulls and we were both really disappointed. Um, some people did get theirs right but I knew that was there that day and I was so upset that I kind of got robbed from it because the lifting cast shut down well it looks like you took a national record on bench so that's why you end up with this kind of strange number of a 402 um you won the national title I don't I remember vaguely like watching the 47s because I knew about you and I knew like there was this rising superstar I had to tune in but I don't remember was it a close battle um honestly after squats probably not probably not um, so you were kind of cruising yeah honestly okay so I did think and overestimated all of the lifters there I was like top five 
everybody's going to be totaling 400. So I need a total 400. And then I saw, I think squats didn't go so well for some of my competitors. I know one of them got hurt the morning of, so she had to like open lower and like, um, you know, a lot of them were just having maybe an off day. Um, and honestly, that's sad. Like I felt for them. Right. Um, yeah. but at the end of the day, I also had to do what I needed to do. So after yeah. that, I was like, okay, well, I just have to go for it now. And so do you think you learned something from, um, that, that kind of delay, because this kind of stuff happens at meets, you know, mm -hmm. um, yeah. and it's something that, and so like your training style, like, do you train really fast? And so you like, like a really fast flight or do you, or was it just that it was so much longer than, you know, the previous breaks that you had? Um, I think at the time I wouldn't wait longer than like 10 minutes between lifts just because I was, um, I usually like to work up pretty fast mm -hmm. and I get cold really fast too, or like cold. I don't know, really, I guess yeah. I just wasn't moving either. So that kind of, um, made me learn my lesson too, about maybe paying a bit more attention to like what's going on. Cause I was kind of just relying on them to fix it really quickly. And like, obviously mm -hmm. nobody knew how long it would take. You wouldn't have been able to predict that. Nobody would. No. Um, and that's, that's game day. Like stuff happens. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So I think just being better prepared, maybe um, if anything starts taking a bit longer, maybe just staying moving in between, like, honestly, there's nothing much you can do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's just mental also probably like a little bit of a mental thing too, where you're like, Hey, I like, I'm really ready to go and I want to do this. And then, Oh, there's this thing and you're frustrated kind yeah. of get pulled out of the mental space, even if your body is basically still pretty much totally ready to go. Yeah. So that could be it. Um, and so, um, <clears throat> you were just, you were just talking about, um, you warm up really fast. Like you're kind of famous for like just jumping with plates on bench, right? Like that's the joke is like, you don't even take the bar. You just go straight to reds on bench and stuff. Right. And so like, is that something that you're working on or trying to change? No, <laughs> no. <laughs> you're like, you're like, fucking, it works for me. I don't care what anyone else says or does. Um, yeah. is it also too, because you're so busy, because I know like you have a very serious, like you take your school, your education very seriously. So is that part of it as well? Yeah. I like to not spend my whole day at the gym. So, um, part of the reason because, or I guess why I like, um, jump so much or so quickly is because I don't have time. I don't want to spend time, um, more than I need to in there. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's just kind of a shortcut. And honestly, I haven't even fixed it. Like <laughs> I still only like go to a red, like immediately on bench. And that might be a mistake sometimes, but it's just like, I just got to get it, it. it out. <laughs> I personally love just knowing that there's a 47 kilo lifter out there that is just going straight to reds. And like, I'm over here just like warming up at the bar and doing all this stuff with bands and all this stuff. And I just love knowing that like, there's someone out there like yourself that's just like, nope, straight to reds. And then what you just go red, 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 all the way up. <laughs> um, basically like same thing for deadlifts. I go red, red, maybe taken in between and then whatever uh -huh. else. And then okay. squats. If I don't have time, I'll go red, red, whatever else I need. <laughs> just from the start, you go straight up with two reds. Wow. I love it. So yeah. I could see how maybe if they're slow moving meats, that could be a problem for you, you know? Yeah. Um, and uh, luckily you're in the IPF now. Um, you were in prime time at Mega Nats. Those are usually very fast sessions. Yeah. Um, in the IPF, you know, at IPF worlds, they're notoriously extremely fast. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think that's going to be something that's going to help you out a lot. And I haven't, I mean, I, this last year, I watched every single session at IPF World. That's one reason why I'm like very foggy about what happened at Mega Nats because I was like basically on South Africa time, even though I was here um, doing media for, for Power of the America. And yeah, I mean, I didn't think I noticed. I don't think there was any delays, any hiccups at Worlds. Like they're on it. They're like every session is super fast. And you always hear people coming back saying, wow, I didn't expect it to be that fast. So I think this this could bode really well for you. You would have the opposite problem if there was some kind of slowdown or something like that. Yeah, I I prefer to just go. Yeah, well, that makes sense. So, okay, so um, I know you you don't have an infinite number of, t of time for us here, so I want to respect your time. So after Meganats, um, you made a coaching change and you mm -hmm. also made a federation change. So why don't you walk us through like both of those decisions? 
So I had actually reached out to Jason um, like a bit prior to collegiates just because I was interested in what he did, especially like seeing like Taylor Atwood and like people like that. Of course, you're like intrigued because Taylor is, I guess, a smaller male lifter, right? On the smaller side. So I was like, maybe he does smaller lifter coaching. Like maybe that's a specialty. So um, I reached out and I, I think at the time he was like, no, like I don't have spots. And I was like, okay, whatever. So then um, after Mega Nats is when we decided to hop over right and, and so how did that go with... oh you mean start going to pa that was yeah you right and... after mega nuts yeah and that was like you and rob that decided that oh no no this is me and jason okay so oh. yeah so when so when did you finalize things with jason and um how did you was it after you won mega nuts all of a sudden he's like okay uh <laughs> i got room for you now <laughs> or or oh. was it after coll collegiate nuts he was kind of like hey we're gonna make room for you at some point like let's Let's work together or how did well, it we had uh, right after collegiates we had been talking a mm -hmm. bit like just to see getting familiar with each other and like seeing if this would be realistically a good fit for me or not um just because i also didn't want to jump blindly um into something completely new and different than what i had been doing previously so i think that's why i also wanted to wait till after mega nats to hop on to jason's training just because of that i was like i have experience with rob like um, if There's I continue, three going with him, yeah, it's so close. Like it wouldn't be mm -hmm. smart to make a huge change now. So I was like, maybe after, yes. So we did. Okay. I think, I think like within days after Nats, I got on Jason's training. Okay, gotcha. And then when, when, and what went into the decision to switch over to Power Athena America? Um, honestly, um, ever since I got into the USAPL, I would see um IPF performances and I think at the time they were still together like whatever nothing what had gone when you on first yet. when you first started with USAPL yeah yes yeah um so I always had my sights set on maybe I'll go to worlds one day right mm -hmm. and then like changes happen whatever mm -hmm. and I had to switch feds to go to get my goal to worlds and even at the time I think Jason was like are you sure you want to switch like um are you sure you don't just want to stay? And I'm like, you know what? No, I, I need to go for this. So I did. And did it have anything to do? Like, were you looking out at the landscape of, in the 47 kilo weight class and thinking about like going head to head with TIFF? Um, or did it have anything to, like you, you kind of had always had worlds as a goal. So whenever you had just become a national champion, was there any kind of like a letdown feeling of like, okay, I want a national title, but now what? Um, I think at the time TIFF was getting really big. So I was like, dang, like this might be harder than I thought. Like I might have to suffer some losses, like even looking at just TIFF and Heather, like they're obviously above me. They have experience. They've done this. I don't know if TIFF has done this longer, but like Heather has done it way longer. Like they're, they have this much more above me. I'm like, I don't know if I can, but I'm going to try. Why yeah. not? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Tiff's like a year older than you. And so, um, she's like, you know, uh, that she has that going for her, but yeah, you definitely started lifting earlier, you know, with, with high school and stuff like that. Um, and then of course, you know, Heather is the savvy veteran of the game that had been and, you know, collected a, multiple world titles and stuff like that before. So were those the lifters, like whenever you were coming up in, in raw power thing, you mentioned before that Steffi Cohen was someone that you had looked up to w who were the other people that you look up to as you were kind of coming up in the sport? I think um, mostly them too, like Heather and Steffi, they're probably the most, I guess, known out of all of them too. Mm -hmm. So they were always on my feed. I was always seeing something about them. Um, and yeah, I think they were basically my motivators to do more <laughs> just and because they're small and I'm small. So <laughs> yeah, it. no, that's, that's great. And did you, were you like a fan of the sport? Did you, do you like watch all the rest of the sessions at mega nationals or were you, you were familiar with Taylor Atwood, um, and mm -hmm. Jason and the strength, the strength guys. Um, so were you like, were you paying attention to the sport or were you mostly just looking like Heather Tiff and then like, you know, Steffi Cohen and other women of your similar size? Um, I'm familiar with most people, I think, in the sport. I like to watch, like I know at Mega Nats, I would watch almost every session. Like even if I wasn't in the room, I would watch it over Zoom or like just stay up to date with yeah. um, new or long lifters. I don't know, whatever. Yeah. But yeah, I would stay up to date with all of them. And now I think I have like 
a lot of good friends that are in different weight classes too that help me stay up to date just because like I'm not a, in a that different fed anymore so it's like yeah. changes are happening and some things I don't even know <laughs> yeah like do you watch did you I mean you were competing at Meganet so it's probably pretty hard this year um, but in the past you mentioned you have been watching worlds in the past and tuning in and see what was going on did you would you watch all of the sessions or just the 47s I think I would watch the 47s mostly yeah, yeah. That's how a lot of lifters are, especially younger lifters. I think, um, focus a little bit on your weight class, which is totally natural. Um, and then yeah. as you kind of develop through a sport and especially you get to a super high level, like yourself, you start to become more aware of like the sport as a whole, uh, like yeah. what's big, what's been going on in the sport. So, um, what was it like then after Megan you join on with, with the strength guys, you got Jason, you have Tori on your side as well. Um, and so just tell us, like, give us a little bit of behind the scenes of like, everyone I think is fascinated by the strength guys, um, because they do have, they have Taylor, they have Leah, the two highest like dots in tested powerlifting ever. Um, so they're obviously a pretty dominant force right now. What's it like working with them? Like, what was it like on day one? Were you overwhelmed or, or, it, you know, just give us kind of a, a little look behind the curtain of what it's like to work with them. Um, honestly, I think right off the bat, Jason made me feel very comfortable um with them specifically he like really welcomed me into it and um we sometimes still have conversations about like um what they've done in the past or things like that like just random things but he really made me feel like this was a fit for me um everything that he does for me I feel like is specifically for me like I don't know if that makes sense um yeah. I just feel super comfortable lifting underneath them and I know even before like I joined with them um I was asking around for other people's experiences just because I know other top lifters um at Mega Nats had been under them previously and anything they said I just took kind of with a grain of salt and I'm like everybody's experience is different um of course it may not work for someone but it does work for me and uh, ultimately like it has been um I think even since the beginning he has just built me up like not even just physically but like mentally as well that's a really good point i mean i think um that's an underrated aspect of mm -hmm. of working with a coach is like the 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 right fit with the personalities mm -hmm. um and also like the mental game as well um and it seems like tell me if i'm wrong but like what what's your what do you study in university i study biochemistry biochemistry so really smart science stuff um, and then you're also, you're partnered up with Jason, who you could argue is like one of the more scientific, you know, data driven, um, you know, kind of science nerd type coach that you could find, right? Like, I think it's a great fit. Like it's a super great fit. I've met Jason. I, I love him. He's super nice. He's super nice to me when, when he didn't know me from anybody. So, I mean, anyone that treats a stranger the way that he treated me, I always respect. Um, and obviously super smart extremely smart guy the results speak for themselves but i think that's a perfect fit for you you know mm -hmm. um just given like your background and what you study and everything like that do so you think that contributes that you guys are kind of on the same wave wavelength yeah every single thought that i've had or like related to training mm -hmm. um every single thought or goal that i've had he's always matched that he's always like yeah i think we can do that and more and i'm like oh my god i think the same like oh my gosh, I'm being recognized finally. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. That's really great. Yeah. I mean, I was talking with Heather, um, on, on the same podcast and I, and I just mentioned, I, I think you just made really great, smart choices with your coach. And then what does, what does Tori do for you? Cause I know she, Jason asked me to always tag Tori whenever I repost you as well. So I was curious and yeah. So how does that work? Kind of having well, two coaches. Um, well, same thing. Like she is just the same as Jason. They're both um, super friendly, super helpful. Um, they always just help elevate my mental to like a different level. Um, even when I can't, like, I know I posted that a while ago or maybe like last week there that sometimes like they hold me up when I can't myself. Yeah. And that's something really great that I really love about both of them. Cause they also work really well as a team. Um, and Tori has really helped me, especially with bench. Cause she also had to make a lot of changes for the IPF rule. Oh yeah. Let's get into that real quick. What, <laughs> what changes did you have to make? Honestly, there is a good time period maybe for since my October meet mm -hmm. to like January, 
um, I was making changes almost on the daily, every single training session, I would wow. find something to tweak, I would move this out, um, move this in, whatever, make tiny, tiny changes every day. And then I'd be like, oh, this is a good fit. Mm -hmm. And then I'd change it the next day because I'm like, oh, I forgot how to do it. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. It's a big <laughs> ask. You, you definitely, I think amongst the power of Teen America potential national team, uh, members, uh, are, were affected a lot, right? Because your bench, you do think your, your elbows weren't, weren't getting close to depth before, right? No, um, previously, like I think even the October meet, they were literally so high. Like there was a good few inches there that. <laughs> so how was that mentally? I mean, were you, were, did you just feel like, you know, damn, like this was like one of my big weapons and now it's gone or this is just a new challenge. I'm going to take, I'm going to defeat it. Honestly, it, I think it was a mix of both. Cause, um, it was definitely, or I, what I consider one of my best lifts bench decrease to learn new um technique in order to like build that back up I think it really put me down a lot because of those changes and I just felt like I wasn't strong enough um but as time went on I just kept on sticking to it I'm like I'm not switching my decision like I'm still gonna stay IPF like yeah. we're gonna keep at it and I will hit this and I think I have proved many people wrong that say you can't hit this without an arch now I can yeah. like <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. Yeah. Your response right away when all this bench uh, rule stuff came out, you were, you were steadfast and strong. You never, you never wavered even once. And, you know, you were just like, I'm going to figure it out and I'm going to do it. Um, it must've been really nice having a, a whole team of coaches behind you. Um, because I know even other coaches can kind of get involved and in stuff on the strength guys team and everything like that. And having Tori to be also, in, I, well, I don't know what weight class is she in. Is she like a 52 or something or around 52 or yeah, she's 57. a 57, 57. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. And, um, so that's useful to have her like in, in, if her bench is similar, you know, really try to work. And then of course they coach a ton of other people who are also going through this, not just in the U S but all throughout the IPF. And so, um, uh, I'm sure you're, you're in the best possible hands you could be in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that must've been confidence inspiring. <laughs> Yeah, I do really love working with them. They're awesome. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, mm -hmm. all right. And so then going into this meet in October, you pretty much blew the doors off your total, went up to 412.5 kilos. What do you think, you know, was it just hard work? Was there more technique changes that that went into that total? Was it just a really good day that you had? Um, or do you just expect like, I'm going to put like 12 kilos on my total every six months? honestly I like I told you I have really big goals and usually at the time when I set them I know I can't hit them at the time mm -hmm. but when like meet day comes or something I know that I have to stick with it like if I set that six months prior I will try my best to get that right mm -hmm. so um that's exactly how I felt going into this October meet I was like I need to PR like at least something, at least 10 kilos. I'm like, I need it. Like, um, yeah. I know I could do much more and yeah, I just ended up doing it. I don't have meat day anxiety. I think, which okay. is a big thing that maybe a lot of other lifters experience, mm -hmm. but I'm just not nervous. I think because I've had exposure to it, even in high school, like since I was young, I think I'm just used to it. Yeah. You've done a lot of meats for someone of your age, you know, a ton in, in, uh, in high school, I can't even count these up very fast, but it's like 20 plus meets. Do you know mm -hmm. off the top of your head? Oh man, we would do one like every weekend. Yeah. So I'm not really sure, but it's yeah. probably close to that number, like 20. Yeah. That's, that's really big for someone that's 21 <laughs> years old. Uh, in, you know, not, you still have a whole year left at 21 as well. So that's, that's really cool. Um, how was that meet with power of teen America? How was your first experience with us? Um, I think it was actually, really good like um Miriam was one of the meat directors yeah her and her husband um Rodney, yeah yes they are amazing I talked to them in person that day um they were super accommodating um very helpful and overall nice people I really enjoyed that even though it was a yeah. smaller meet I think there was not more than 20 lifters that day um I loved it yeah 
Yeah, they're they're among the best people in all of powerlifting that you'll ever meet. And um, Miriam is the Secretary General of Powerlifting America. She's on the Executive Committee, and they're running meets all the time. They're they're super great, super nice people. So I'm really happy to hear that because I I knew that you were signed up for that meet, and I was like, they're such good people. That's going to be a good fit for you. So that's fantastic to hear. And for anyone else that's you know wondering about the people that are behind Powerlifting America. These are the kind of people that are behind Power of the America, um, the Elms, as we call them, you know, Rodney and Miriam Elms. So they're fantastic, good people. So it's great to hear that. What have you done since October then? Um, you've been working on the bench. Um, you've been getting stronger. You've been hitting PRs. Um, so coming into Power of the America Nationals, which were like a week out, we're exactly a week out. You'll be done competing this time next year, next week, I think around this time, because it is kind of a later in the day session kind of be a, a prime time session. Um, so what are you looking to do at Power of Teen American Nationals? Well, I don't want to throw out numbers. Okay. Yeah. You don't. Yeah. Yeah. Don't, <laughs> don't make Jason get mad at me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He might get mad if I like to put too much information out there. Yeah. Um, I'm just kidding. I don't think he would, but like yeah. either way, um, I have a goal in my mind and I think I could hit that. Um, this past month has been a little bit rough. Most people don't know, but I've been dealing with like a quad injury kind of, okay. um, and it's hard rehabbing that, um, just because Where does like, it affect, does it affect your squat then and your, and your sumo? No, only my squat, which is really weird. Um, which kind of sucks. Cause that's the lift that I made the most progress on, okay. but um, it doesn't like hinder me. It just like hurts. So, <laughs> it, so you're gonna have to tough it out. Yeah. And nationals. yeah, that's been putting like my mind in like a stress mode. Cause I'm like, is it going to be healed by meet day? Um, or will I just have to compete like this? Like either way, mm. it's fine. I'm going to do the best I can that day. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. So let's get, I'm going to pry a little bit more. Uh, I'm not going to let you get away with not saying anything <laughs> about the numbers other than this, you have a goal in your head. Um, but so the qualifying total to make it onto the U S national team is 401. And do you think that you're going to hit that number in, at nationals? I don't think it's going to be an issue at all. Oh, okay. That's what I love to hear. That's a good soundbite. Um, <laughs> So you're going to, you're going to easily hit 401. Um, and so if we're talking, are you thinking you're going to put up a PR total? Yeah, I want to, you are going to put up uh, the goal is to always do that. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And so you think I'm asking, like, if you had to go over under yes or no, you, Jesse's going to hit a, a PR total at nationals. Yeah, I think so. That is so cool. I love it. Um, I love the confidence. I mean, your total is, is, I think it's like the second biggest total in the world, um, for 12 and a half. So if you do that, you're going to be doing something that only one other person in the world has ever done. Um, I don't know. I don't know the history of all the records in 47 kilo, maybe Wei Ling Chen had did something like that, but, um, so that's a really bold prediction. And, um, to make that PR total, I'm, I'm rooting for you. I think that'll be so cool to see, um, I was, I love the story of like your bench took a huge hit. Like supposedly it was going to take a huge hit because of this rule change. And then you're going to come out like less than six months later and PR your total anyway. Mm -hmm. Um, and that just seems like, you know, going back to your high school days, when you finished six at that meet, you kind of came out of that and thought, no, I'm going to go back in and I'm going to do it. You know, I'm going to win or same thing when you finished third at, uh, collegiate nationals, your first time there, you're like, no, I'm coming back next year and I'm going to do it. So I love that you have this determined attitude and you're not going to take no for an answer. So that's, that's really awesome. Um, okay. So is there anything else you want to tell us? Are there any other predictions that you want to make for power of the American nationals? I think they're going to take both me and Heather to worlds. All right. I really, I really want them to, honestly. Yeah. I think both of us are on the same page about that because um, I heard a little bit of the podcast earlier and yeah. I know we talked about it, um, but I we're on the same page. I kind of want there to be a three-way battle at Worlds. That'd be really yeah. cool. That's what mm -hmm. I think everyone is really looking forward to is the possibility of a three-way battle at Worlds between the three best 47s the world has ever seen. Um, you can't ask for more than that. 
Um, hopefully it will work out and we'll all, um, you know, we'll get this matchup that everyone's kind of hoping for. Um, but tell us a little bit about, like you mentioned that you talked to Heather, um, and do you talk to Tiff as well? Um, so no, I don't really reach out to Tiff a lot. Honestly, I think I'm just kind of nervous, but we do like, um, like comment on each other's stories sometimes, but nothing more than like, I'd say surface level talk. Um, I would love to talk to her one day though. Um, I think it'd be pretty cool to, I don't know, discuss with somebody that's the best in the world right now, how they're getting there. <laughs> yeah, of course. Yeah. And I mean, um, I've just heard her on, on the King of the List podcast and stuff. It sounds like she's not that confident in her English um, to like have like these kind of conversations. So maybe there's a little bit of a uh, language barrier that could prevent. I know Heather talks to her a little bit as well. Um, she kind of is like this, the veteran queen of the 47s and you're like the two princesses that are coming up under her, you know, and I, I like, I think it's cool. Um, how, how is your relationship with Heather and, you know, how does she inspire you? Honestly, um, I love having Heather as a friend and kind of mentor too. She's yeah. probably one of the first people I talk to when even considering IPF or like going to Worlds. I've asked about her experiences competing internationally, how they affected her, how has her travel affected her? Because I know um, last year was pretty bad with all the yeah. um, airport craziness. Yeah. Um, and I am I just like wonder how she takes it all and just like still comes out and like does a good job. Like she doesn't ever put up like bad numbers ever, <laughs> I think. Yeah, I mean, Maybe, even- Like to, I feel like to her standard, she wants to do more and I know she can do more yeah. but um, you know sometimes those things you also can't predict like the travel stuff yeah it happens that was super disappointing for her and we all know she's like capable of way more than that um she's done like a 410 before um mm -hmm. and I think it's one of those things where we'll see you know she's gonna unwrap a huge total somewhere sometime um it could be at PA Nats or maybe it'll be at the three-way battle at Worlds if you guys both make it what would it what would it mean to you to be like you know, getting on that plane with Heather and like, you know, getting off the, you know, like, like I remember they were telling the stories about South Africa last year, this next year, it's going to be in, it's in Malta, which is going to be, I think a lot easier to get around and stuff, but you know, they're talking about getting off the plane and then they have this two hour bus ride and all this stuff. Like, what would it be like just to have someone like Heather there with you that whole time? I think it'll put my mind at ease because primarily I have somebody to talk to yeah. <laughs> and, um, like I said, she has helped me a lot with so many things behind the scenes. Like everybody thinks that you have to be like enemies with your competitors. Me and yeah. Heather are like the best of friends. <laughs> That's so cool. Yeah. I love to see it. It's like this intergenerational thing, you know, and like we talk in different fields about institutional knowledge, you know, being passed down to the next generation, or it could be forgotten um, because especially in powerlifting turnover is pretty fast, especially in the younger generations. Um, and so it's cool to see this sort of like link through history of the, the original goat of the class. And then now hopefully, hopefully the future greatest of all time, Jessica <laughs> Espinal. Um, and so, yeah, I think I'm, I'm hoping for you. I think that'll be a great story. It'll be really cool to see. Um, I think Heather is, has said that she's going to hit the qualifying total. You have said you're going to hit the qualifying total. So it'll all come down to um if all of the other weight classes hit their qualifying totals and if there's any open spots after the Sheffield lifters are factored in and we'll see but I think it's a great storyline it'll be something very exciting to see and it'll give the whole world a great battle to see at worlds as well yeah for sure so I'm really excited about that okay a couple last questions quick ones um yeah. are you familiar with the Sheffield are you looking uh are you looking forward to that um are you going to be watching Tiff obviously you know at Sheffield and and <laughs> what are your you know what are your thoughts on this this is one of the coolest things and to be so young and being able to have to look forward to like we're going to be able to have this hopefully fingers crossed every year a chance to go to this amazing meet what's it what's that feel like how how excited are you for it Honestly, I am pretty excited. I'm excited to see everybody compete like head to head kind of because it's like I think it's like no weight class battle. It's just like dots, I think. So uh, that's pretty cool. Yeah, it's based on <laughs> it's based on a percentage of the world record. Yeah, um, and yeah, so that's... like, however, if you break the world record by what percentage, that's just what will determine who wins. Yeah. 
Yeah, and I think that's pretty cool. I think it'll be interesting to see how those same lifters go back and like redo or I don't know, maybe do better or whatever at Worlds right yeah. after. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because it's there's still be a nice amount of time. Um, it's like March, April, May, June, three months. Yeah. Uh, you still have like a solid three month prep or whatever. Um, but you're right. I mean, in some sense, you have a little bit of an advantage that you 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 have a longer prep going into Worlds by about a month. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it'll be curious to see. And then I'm just looking forward to see too, like the production. Like I think this is going to be something like we've never seen in powerlifting. Um, I know SBD is just they're the ultimate. They're the you know the biggest company and the biggest supporter of powerlifting in the industry. And I just it's going to be like our Super Bowl, you know, mm-hmm. uh, going forward. And it's like I I hope I just can't wait to see it. I'm super excited for it. So. Um, all right. Well, I'll, the last thing I want to ask about is you're also a coach yourself. Is that right? Yes, I am. Yeah. So tell us about your coaching and, um, you know, like how people can find you if they want to get coaching from you and just, are you associated with, is it associated with Texas A&M or is it a separate thing? No, it's a separate thing. Okay. Yeah. So, um, I actually coach for challenge coaching. It is made by, um, Alex Kano He um, is the first one who had this idea, actually. So me and a couple other friends coach, um, like it started as like just our little friend group and it just has casually expanded and expanded. I think now overall we have maybe around 70 to 80 lifters. So it has gotten pretty big. Um, On my Instagram, in my bio, I have the at to the challenge coaching um, Instagram. And there's also a link in that bio to um, to sign an inquiry form for us. And we immediately get the notifications and we reach out within like a day. (laughs) Okay. That's really cool. How big is your coaching team with challenge coaching? And is it all powerlifting or do you coach other things as well? Um, We do powerlifting like specifically and then nutrition, of course. Okay. That's great. Yeah. And I mean, and you're being coached by the strength guys. So, um, you're learning the tricks of the trade, like from some of the best out there as well. So you can, maybe the challenge coaching will be like a, a mini strength guys type of a situation soon. Yeah. And I know Alex, um, takes from like a lot of the best coaches in right now, like in powerlifting, I'd say, cause he watches like all the Steve videos, all the Marcellus, like Nori, everything that you could think of. He's on it like immediately. It's crazy to see how um, dedicated he is to this. I love it. <laughs> That's great. Well, um, I think, you know, you're super smart, you know, overachiever and everything, you know, and so anyone will be lucky to have you as a coach. And then as well, you know, the people that you're vouching for with challenge coaching, you know, if, if you're on the team, then they must be good people as well. Yeah, they're awesome. <laughs> All right. Well, that's great. All right, Jessica. Well, we got it done in not too far over an hour. So um, thank you so much for joining us here today. And is there anyone else that you want to shout out or give a thank you to or any sponsors or anything like that that you want to give a shout out to? Um, I think I'd love to give a shout out to SVD, Virus, and Jacked because they're always like reaching out to me and doing the best possible for me. And of course, my support system, my friends, family, anybody who's always there for me. Um, Alex's family, um, I love them. They're awesome. They're my biggest supporters too. Just, I don't know, everybody who is in my circle right now, I love. That's great. I'm hey, Powerlifting America is in your circle right now. And, so. and y'all too. And yes, so y'all too. <laughs> <laughs> no, we love having you in our circle. So it's pretty, it's pretty awesome, Jessica. Um, well, thank you so much for joining us. Um, and thank you to everyone out there who listens to the Powerlifting America podcast. It's a new thing. And um, we really appreciate, especially these early guests like Jessica coming on here and giving us their time. So thank you very much. And with that, we'll say peace out. Bye. <laughs>